It's a great honor to be with President Kagame. And we have uh, had tremendous uh, discussions on Rwanda. The job they've done is uh, absolutely terrific. We have trade with Rwanda. Uh, and just general, I would say, great relationships. Uh, I want to congratulate you, Mr. President, uh, as being the new head of the African Union. That's a great honor. This was just announced recently, and uh, that really truly is a great honor. So please give my regards. I know you're going to your first meeting very shortly. And please give my warmest regards. But it's an honor to have you as a friend. Thank you. Thank you, Thank you very much. Well, it was a great honor to meet uh, the President of the United States, uh, President Donald Trump. And uh, we had good discussions uh, on those two levels. Uh, the, bilateral relations uh, between Rwanda and the United States. Rwanda has benefited tremendously uh, from the support of the United <coughs> States in many areas where it is in peace support operations we have carried out in different parts of the world. We had the United States on our side supporting us. They have supported our economy in trade, investment. We see a lot of uh, uh, Tourists from the United States, visitors sure. coming to Rwanda, and uh, President, I wanted to thank you for uh, the support you have received from you personally and the administration. And uh, we are looking forward to also working with the United States at the level of the African Union, where we are carrying out reforms at the African Union so that we get our act together to do the right things. and. That helps in cooperating with the United States. Uh, it would be more beneficial when we are organized to know what we want from the United States sure. for that cooperation. So I thank you very much. Well, I thank you very much. And it's a great honor to have all of you here. And uh, we'll speak for a little bit longer. And thank you very much. Thank you. Uh, we have uh, here in the room a group of students who spent an entire semester concentrating intently on studying Rwanda. Yeah. I think these are some students who will be engaged with Rwanda for a long time. Some of them already expressed an interest in going to visit. Um, so this is a wonderful culmination to a long and intense study of Rwanda that, that we've undertaken over the last semester. So the students are here. They've each prepared a question. I'm going to turn it over to our first student, if that's OK with you. Sure. I just have to warn you, studying Rwanda is a handful. So. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, okay. Mr. President, thank you for uh, joining us today. Really appreciate it. My question is about your leadership style. Yeah, you ran a rebel army in the bush and now a nation. During that transition, what leadership skills did you find were transferable and what did you have to change about the way that you led? Well, uh, I'm not sure what is uh, transferable or not, but uh, what I know is uh, one can share one's experiences and understanding and approach to many aspects of life, uh, as you have described. Uh, to be transferable has two parts. One is transferring, but the other one is receiving. So I'm not sure what the other one would be willing to. But the best way I can describe it is to understand the situation, talk about how you, you've dealt with it, how you have approached it, and maybe people can make comparison of the situation one has managed and how uh, with other situations and circumstances. So uh, that, that is the way to, to, to do it. Uh, otherwise, I guess some things are transferable, others may not depending on uniqueness of maybe the situation uh, that people have managed. If there are things I could do, do differently, or, well, I, I, 
I, I should say I don't spend much time on that. I try to see some things are already in the past. There are things there, there is. There are things you ca you may not be able to do anything about. About those situations, because they are in the past and they can't come back. So the focus should be on the present and the future. Uh, because new problems emerge, new circumstances do also, and uh, so that's why you, you try to learn from what you dealt with in the past and see whether it is applicable in the moment uh, or not. And, and that's how you proceed. So I, I really don't take much time finding what thing in the past would I have done differently, but I, I look at the present and the future. Um, so my question is related to one of this um, incredible, fast and pro pro progressive trajectory over the past 28 years. Um, I'm just curious what your um, main priorities of the remaining two years you have in office and what have been like, the main successes and um, frustrations throughout um, the past four years? Well, you know, the whole story about Rwanda, where we have come from, where we are and where we want to be. Uh, so I spend most of my time, day and night maybe, uh, trying to figure out. But of course, when I say I, it isn't so much I. It's not, it's not me, it's, it's uh, many other people who have to work with different bo levels. And um, so we, we fully understand where we have come from. The underlying causes of the different problems that we have to manage. Uh, so these are what, and then uh, I've continued to, to, to try and manage that, but also back and forth with the population and citizens to understand uh, how they feel, what they can contribute, uh, what they think can be done to alleviate most of their problems. And that's why we have different structures and organizations to to manage that. Uh, and we have to measure what has happened, where we are coming from, uh, and how much have we done. If you look at in the area of reconciliation, have the people really come together to what extent and do they understand the problems of the past and so that we uproot this kind of uh, 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 divisive politics that we have witnessed not only just divisive but costly in human life terms and um, so it has to be founded that Rwanda model is really founded on two principles. One, so our people and our history on one hand, but then it's also our future. Where, where do you want to go? So what so far we have done and the results We've got, I think, we are on the right path, path in my view, and 
That's what the people feel, that's the feedback we get. Uh, it is work in progress, everything we are, we are doing. Um, so we, we, we are not where we need to be or want to be. But I think I, I, I don't find other ways of doing what we are doing to... Yes. Uh, um, I wanted to know what your personal um, priorities would be um, in the remaining two years. My personal what? Priorities. The priorities have been there f for a long time, so uh, that's why I'm saying the priorities are not just uh, one or two remaining. It's uh, either consolidation of what you have done and found to be helpful, or, but otherwise the priorities have been there from the beginning up to now, even now, and we see we want a united country, we want a prosperous country, we want a country that is at peace with itself and secure and stable, so priorities come in that package. So talking about uh, in the remaining time of my office, is, is, it shouldn't stop with when I'm in, in the office or, or, or not. It should be continuous even after my service to my country. Thank you so much. Hi, Mr. President, thank you so much for joining us. So my question relates to Rwanda's electoral process. Rwanda's electoral process has historically come under criticism for the lack of political diversity. Uh, and my question for you is, do you imagine a future in which competing political parties would campaign against each other for power in Rwandan elections? Or do you believe that would lead to more divisions and undermine national unity? Well, f f f first of all, some questions uh, are, are not difficult, like I'm going to say, but the, the, it is hard to understand what is being asked. Uh, electoral process has been criticized. So uh, uh, for, for what? I, don't, I didn't get it. What, what is wrong with the electoral process, if you could mention, because our electoral process is what it is, and uh, participation in, in that is what it is. So I, I, I haven't understood the, the standards we should be conforming to that we don't. I, I didn't get it. So it's essentially the view that some believe that not enough different political opinions have been represented in previous Rwandan elections. Yes, yeah, still, the measure of that, uh, is it by number of uh, political parties that participate, or is it uh, by what? Uh, this is what I'm failing to, to, to understand. That's why I'm not giving you a very good answer, maybe, that you wish for, but uh, Rwandans haven't complained about it. So these ones you are talking about who are complaining, I don't know. Is there a global commission that uh, puts a standard to what type of elections countries should have, and we have scored law on, on that, and even then, nothing has been communicated to us if it was there, so I, I, that's what I don't understand. Hi, Mr. President. Thank you for speaking with us. Um, during the COVID pandemic, tourism was one of the hardest hit industries worldwide, and Given that tourism plays a significant role in Rwanda's economy and was growing steadily before the pandemic, what is the government planning to do to support tourism in the aftermath of the pandemic? 
Yeah, it's true. Um, first of all, uh, tourism uh, has been uh, a fast-growing uh, sector of our economy, uh, and it was hit badly, of course, during the pandemic. But uh, we have also now started seeing good recovery, and uh, in fact, we are more or less around 80% uh, of what it used to be before uh, COVID. Uh, what we have done during that time of COVID and uh, towards the end, now COVID is at minimum. We positivity rate in the country is between 0 and 0.1% 0 currently. So we, we thank God that's the way it is now, watching to see the trend in the country and around, uh, but so far so good. Um, so what we did, in fact, we put a recovery fund, uh, government mobilized the recovery fund uh, for different sectors, and one of the sectors that uh, uh, was targeted was tourism, and they benefited from uh, that fund we gave to the struggling uh, uh, institutions of uh, tourism sector, the hotels, the different businesses, and uh, we, we've uh, kept them afloat. They, they seem to be doing fine. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. President, for uh, speaking with us. Um, my question is about the Congo. Um, so with uh, President Chisikini's election four years ago, there was a major shift in um, the Congo's leadership. Some have noted that there's been a more conciliatory tone between Rwanda and the Congo, but there's still um, certainly lingering uh, disagreements. Would you say that um, his election and his leadership in the Congo has been for the better with regards to Rwanda's relationship with the Congo? Or would you say that there are ongoing problems with the direction that the Congo's heading still? I think things have gotten much better from the previous administration in DRC, in Congo, and the current one. Uh, and the main reason is there is good communication. Uh, at least we discuss the problems that are there as we understand them, each side, and try to look for a way forward. Uh, so far, uh, the progress is good, and trying to deal with the problems that uh, are still lingering on, like uh, the security issues that have always been in the eastern part of Congo, we have discussed that. We are trying to find uh, ways to resolve those uh, problems. Uh, the other day, we were in Nairobi, Kenya, uh, meeting uh, with President Sekedi, myself, President Museveni, with President Uhuru Kenyatta as our host. And uh, there is another meeting coming uh, tomorrow, day after tomorrow. Uh, all these are to look for ways we can uh, address the remaining problems uh, in the Congo that affect Congo, affect the region, but also specifically affect uh, Rwanda. So I, I, can I can only say there is good progress. I, I, I don't have much to worry about. Thank you. Thank you, Congress President. Um, so I want to talk a little bit about the post-genocide period. Um, so in the immediate post-genocide period, you faced uh, looming security threats both, both over the border in the Congo and then um, with the growing insurgency uh, in the rural parts of the country. Um, 
He used a variety of tactics, political, military, hearts and minds campaign development to try to address these security challenges. Um, in your view, looking back, what do you find was effective and what was ineffective? Um, and what do you think was the decisive factor in your uh, eventual victory over the insurgency? Well, having uh, those uh, different uh, factors looked at like that and dealt with in the same way is helpful. Uh, so, and, and most of those tactics we have applied have uh, contributed to the success we have uh, achieved. Maybe some might have contributed more than others, but I think uh, there isn't one we think we should not have applied. Uh, but the most notable ones are applying military security solutions to the problem because that's largely what it is, uh, has been helpful because that was the immediate one. That, to defeat the insurgency, the armed groups that threaten uh, the stability of our country. That one had to be immediate and focused and decisive. I think that, that one, and then you deal with the wider issues uh, that are political, that are economic, that are social, uh, these take time, they require resources, they require convincing, they require, so we, we but, but they are very, very important. The, 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 in the end, you have to deal with that, uh, and that's what we did. So military, political, security came in first, and then social, economic, and then uh, relations, how we relate to, to, to neighbors, how we benefit one another, and all these come into play, and uh, uh, I think in a combination, they have been very helpful. Yeah, so, so in terms of the kind of the, the priority, the military solution, the decisive uh, military solution to the issue, that was the kind of the main priority that you had to deal with. Um, when you were specifically using military tactics to fight the insurgency, right, this took several years to kind of solve the issue. And, and how do you think that, why do you think you were successful in your effort, and what was kind of the defining characteristic of that successful military effort? Well, the only time we had it took uh, was because mainly some of the things, of the problems are originating from the outside, not best internally. So we didn't have control of the outside. There's no way we could have, uh, other than trying therefore to, on the basis of relations we create with our neighbors and others beyond, uh, to try and deal with that. So that at the same time when any such a problem would cross our border into Rwanda, then we, uh, that one becomes easier to deal with, and that's what, what, what we did. Um, so our approach was focused, it was deliberate, and we were prepared, all along we have been prepared for uh, dealing with matters of security, and that goes way back into our history, the problems we have faced and uh, the solutions we have applied, uh, and, and the mindset. We, we, we've been prepared to deal with such uh, situations. Hello, Mr. President. Thank you so much for speaking with us. Uh, my question relates to the deal that was recently made public uh, between Rwanda and the United Kingdom. 
uh, to process asylum cases um, and migrants. Um, why did Rwanda enter into uh, such an agreement? Uh, and what does Rwanda stand to gain? Um, and finally, what are the implications of such an arrangement with regards to Rwanda's presence within the international community? To understand uh, this problem better, we, we've got to go a little bit into the history. This problem of dealing with uh, immigrants does not start with what we arrived at as the deal between United Kingdom and Rwanda. It may as well, before that, but let me talk about 2018. Uh, when uh, we helped to deal with the situation in Libya, where there are so many Africans mainly from different parts of the continent, but a big part from the West African part of the region. And uh, these people were stuck in Libya, they were trying to cross into Europe, some had already died trying to cross the Mediterranean. Others were kept in prison in Libya, in different cities of Libya. And they were really stuck, including the NHCR. Everybody who was trying to deal with the problem had got stuck. So at that time, 2018, I was the chairman of the African Union. And when the issue came up to me, I said, well, we are not a rich country, we are not a big country, but there are solutions we can always help uh, find uh, and solve big problems. So we told uh, those international institutions that are trying to deal with the problem and the countries uh, and the UN and so on, that why don't you actually bring these people to Rwanda? And three ways of dealing with it. When they come to Rwanda, we can even offer them to stay in Rwanda because even if our standards of living and so on and so forth may not be the best in the world, nowhere near to that, certainly what we can provide these people is much better than being in a prison in Libya that has no government, that has nothing, and many of them were dying there, and is certainly better than trying to continue to Europe and end up dying in the Mediterranean. He said, certainly our standards would be much better than that. The second thing is they would process these people, those concerned, to take them to countries anywhere that would accept them. But coming from a stable situation like the one we would provide. Or they may even choose to say, we want to go back to our countries where we originated from, because over time we've learned that uh, this is a very difficult situation and so on, we no longer want to go to Europe or can't certainly want to be in Libya, and therefore they may choose to go back home. That's where it starts really. That's, that's the, the offer, the deal to, to solve this problem starts at that time. In fact, the evidence is, right as we speak, there are some of those from Libya who have come in in the recent months, and there are others, hundreds of them, that have been processed in these camps in Rwanda and taken to Canada, to different parts of Europe, France, the Scandinavian countries, the, even the UK itself and the US. They've, they've been, uh, that, that has been happening. So, now I think uh, people were observing that, and certainly UK, which has now, like some other countries in Europe, they have problems of migration. And migration complicated even further by 
people who smuggle these human beings and earn a lot of money from that and simply keep taking people to whether France, UK, or I have had others, to, you know, up to the Scandinavian countries, Denmark, and so on and so forth. So we were approached because of this history and because of what we managed of the Libyan case. And we said, of course, and what they were telling us was clear. They are having people being smuggled into the country. And by the way, the, the, here the problem is, there is one aspect of, of that that is uh, always highlighted at the expense of other things that uh, need to be considered. That all these people who are going to Europe or to UK are people being persecuted in their own countries. That is partly true. But it is not all these cases that it applies to. Because some of them, and again here is the case, can afford to pay thousands of euros or dollars or pounds to be smuggled into these countries. Some of them are people with money actually, or that have no such problems as those that may be persecuted. It's just whoever can pay, then he can find a way. And, and most of these people are not necessarily people who are bad off, even economically. But they, they, it's a mentality issue again. Well, if you asked any ordinary Rwandan or any other ordinary African and say, are you happy here? Do you want to go to Europe? I can give you a way to Europe or to America or to Canada. The first uh, choice for these people, they say, yeah, 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 we want to go. Please take us there. Even if they are going to lead worse life there than they actually have. I I'm talking about the reality. These are facts. This is so some people just read the newspapers, they see this and make conclusions. I'm telling you the real life of this. So that's how we, 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 we came to have a discussion with the UK. And what UK is saying, they don't want these people being smuggled into the United Kingdom. They want to have another way of sorting out people they must accept, and others they can say, no, we don't accept. Even when they are here, some of them may actually end up being taken back. Almost similar to that case I mentioned earlier of Libya, where these people are brought from Libya, brought here, and they were sorting them out, and it took time. Some are still waiting. They are on the waiting list. They are here. At least they are here, still alive. They are here being looked after decently, like is affordable, and uh, the international community has been assisting in this. So it would be mistaken for people to just make a conclusion, oh, you know, Rwanda got money, the, it's not trading. It's, we are not trading human beings, please. <laughs> this is not the case. <laughs> we are actually helping. Uh, and, and I've given you the background of where this comes from. And uh, so UK naturally is going to provide resources to actually give some decent living to these people who will be here as they are processed either to go back to UK, or maybe UK may work with other countries to take some of them, and so on and so forth. So it, it, it's a clear-cut issue, and uh, it was actually something uh, of an innovation that Rwanda put forth to, to deal with these migration issues. 
And we have other refugees staying here, have stayed here for now decades. Refugees from Burundi, from Congo, from different parts of our region, they are here, we, we, we live with them, and some of them we have provided for them, the education, the different things that, uh, of course, nobody wants to be a refugee, nobody should be a refugee. Uh, and it's not uh, even, you can't say, oh, they are well off as refugees. No, even if economically you may look fine, but being a refugee is a different issue. Thank you. Uh, thank you again, Mr. President, for uh, taking the time to speak with us. Um, the uh, current situation with the United Kingdom uh, has a precedent in a similar agreement between Rwanda uh, and Israel in 2014, uh, which received uh, a lot of criticism surrounding the um, safety and treatment of those being sent uh, by Israel, as well as, uh, as you had sort of touched on the vulnerability to human traffickers uh, throughout the process. Um, and so, uh, what do you anticipate going differently uh, now with the United Kingdom to address these concerns? Um, and could you also speak more on Rwanda's uh, relationship uh, with Israel in general? Well, first of all, I, I, I hope you can get your facts correct. With Israel case, it was not the problem with Rwanda. The problem developed in Israel. Because while we are trying to process them, like I have mentioned in other cases, then there came an issue that they were being forced to leave Israel. And in fact, that's what killed the deal. Because they were not forced, they, they, they were not supposed to force people to come to Rwanda. It was on a voluntary basis. This is what the deal was. This is what we had agreed. And again, what, did, what is it that attracted us? Most of these, actually all of them, were these poor brothers and sisters uh, from Africa. And they had left, most of them, they were from, they had left, uh, Ethiopia, Eritrea, and some other surrounding countries. And so they, they, they were not accepted there. They were being thrown out. In fact, they were forced out. And we said, no, instead of people going, being caught up in between these forces that wanted them out and then the laws that say, no, they should be here, and they end up with nothing, we said, these are people we can, we are not, uh, by the way, by any standard, a big country, but uh, we believe we can accommodate as many people as uh, are being thrown out in some places. Uh, so, facts, first of all, facts are the, the whatever happened between us and Israel does not the problem does not lie with us. The problem lied with how they were being brought, and that's what killed the deal. And I think maybe they did not even bring here 30% of what we had agreed they would bring here. And that's how it stopped. So now, our relationship with Israel, we have a very good relationship with Israel. We have a good relationship. In fact, it is one of uh, our major policies to have good relationship uh, with as many countries as, as possible. Now, including uh, countries that may, as you may read in the news and whatever, have problems. But some of those problems are those countries' problems, not ours. So, and, and if we create a good relationship with them, sometimes we even uh, put in a word of uh, good advice, if we can, 
and it might be helpful because uh, of that good relationship we have created. So with Israel we have very good relationship uh, and we work well together in areas of technology, of agriculture, uh, education, and health, and many things like that. And, and I think the benefits have been very, have been clear. Thank you. Hi, Mr. President. Thank you for taking our questions. Um, I want to ask about uh, the, the Iran relationship with France. You have met now on several occasions with President Macron, and um, he has apologized somewhat for uh, France's role in the 94 genocide. How would you characterize the current Rwandan-French relationship? Are there any remaining barriers between you? And do you anticipate any changes to that relationship should um, Le Pen be elected president instead of Macron? Well, somewhat apology is better than no apology. That's where I start from. I, I think that was a good start for us to... Um, there have been uh, commissions that were set up by our side, by France, to, to really get to the bottom of what happened and in Rwanda and by whom and so uh, and that naturally brought in France to, to put light on their responsibility. So based on that, fortunately President Macron I think comes from a, a different sort of background in, in that country. Uh, he doesn't uh, carry that much baggage on, like some politicians do. I think that's what helped him to have a different way of looking at things and we embraced that and worked with him and so far the relationship is going well and we are, we are making very good progress. We are happy with the relationship we have between us and France. But as you know, there is never a perfect situation, so we are not looking for a perfect situation because we, we, we know that it doesn't exist. Uh, but so far, what we have is good enough to, to, to continue. Now, about, uh, in the case where in the future, near future, to have uh, a President Le Pen. Well, first of all, I think this would be a bigger problem for France than for Rwanda. I, I think that, that you are, <laughs> because irrespective of who becomes the President of France, we, we deal with them as uh, we have to deal with them and uh, make sure that uh, we, we remain intact. So I am sure given her background and what people say about her and what she says about herself, she might be a problem for, for, for France, for Rwanda, for Africa, for maybe other Europeans. Uh, but again, that's not for me to decide who becomes uh, the leader of any country later on in France. Hi, Mr. President. Thank you so much for joining us today. I've heard so many great things about you from my mother, Doreen Bogdan, who works at the, at the ITU. Um, Thank you. Um, my uh, my question for you today was, uh, what do you think Rwanda's next big challenge is? Well, there, there will always be challenges. We have them now. There might be. But I think 
I prefer to see it this way. The biggest challenge to us is the sustainability of good progress that we have already made and even uh, make going further than we have. Sustainability for me is important. For other challenges, they always come. It's like we had this pandemic, we don't know where it came from, but uh, well, it came and hit us and hit everybody in the world and each one tried to survive in the space they had. And, and we did survive that, we managed that. But I don't really see anything completely different from what we've gone through, first of all, and what we have dealt with. And I just, my mind prefers to say, how can we always anticipate, you know, be proactive and uh, sustain what we have identified as, as good wins we have made over the years. Thank you so much. Yeah. Hi, thank you so much for speaking with us. It's a pleasure and an honor. Um, looking forward, your, well, the end of your term is coming up in 2024, so we were all wondering, um, what is your main criteria in choosing a successor um, in the upcoming election? Well, since you are me choosing, or you just you just mean choosing in general? Yes. What should the country choose? What do you think the main criteria we should look? For? Well, somebody who. I mean, I, we we look at where again where we have come from, how we arrived at uh, where we are now, and continuing to have a stable country that can continue on a good path for prosperity of our people and the unity and the relations, good relations we have with other countries in the region, in the region, integration and so on and so forth. So that, that should, be, should be a person who really deeply understands uh, the management of uh, these issues you have had to deal with and we shall always deal with for the foreseeable future. Would you ever consider running again? Yeah, but I don't know. I will see. I, uh, I, I'm, I'm spoiled for choice. <laughs> Thank you so much. Yeah, thank you. Thank you so much for joining us, Mr. President. Uh, I'm from Sri Lanka, and as you would know, my country went through a 30 year civil war between the Tamil and Sinhalese ethnic groups. Um, and 12 years down the line, our reconciliation efforts are still weak, and there's a stark divide uh, between the two groups. I visited Rwanda in 2016 and saw the tangible impacts uh, of your efforts in the country and was really impressed. And I just want to seek your advice on what you would say the, the best thing is for reconciliation in a post-conflict environment. It, it's not so much the advice that I would give you that is lacking. Not only in Sri Lanka, but it would be the same case for any other country that may have similar problems. It's about having the leaders and the politics that really works to deliver solutions to these problems. And I think whether it is in Sri Lanka or any other country, theoretically, if they are to be listening to us or in the, that room or in this one, 
they would probably be having these possible solutions on their fingertips. But the problem is how, how now to create a real life around this sort of uh, ideas, these ideas and the advice, and the people to execute that. So, but, but I'm sure in Sri Lanka, if you ask so many people, one on one, they would tell you what I'm going to tell you or what I have told you. Yes, it's getting to the bottom of the root causes of whatever problem there is, and uh, it will involve give and take from different groups that are party to the problem. You can't have it all your way, but neither should you have nothing your way. So there is that balance to, to be struck, and it just doesn't happen. It will have to have leaders to, you know, to look in the eyes of the problem and, and deal with it. Mm. Thank you very much. Thank you. Uh, hello, Mr. President. Again, thank you so much for speaking with us. Uh, a major component of our seminar has been the discussion of uh, the successes of Rwanda's development program in the wake of the 1994 genocide. Uh, where, what do you see from the future of Rwanda? Um, 25 years, where do you see the country both socially and economically? May I, I, I missed some uh, parts of the question at the beginning. What you... Oh, yeah. I was just saying that a major focus of our seminar has been discussing the successes of Rwanda's development project okay. in the wake of the genocide, All and right. where you see the country socially and economically in the next 25 years. Yeah. You see, from the beginning, Rwanda was at its lowest point in every aspect of life in 1994. Not that we were any better off by far before that, but so we had to start from scratch and uh, it was complicated. It was actually a complex thing to try and deal with. But social and economic are part of what we have to address. There's no question about it. A hungry person, person with a disease dying at home, not even a hospital because there are none. And if you have that common in the population, you know, it's a problem. It doesn't matter what you're talking about. Nothing else goes through their ears, nothing, however good you may think that is, until that is. So we, we concentrated on the politics of saying, no, the basics, the basic needs of these Rwandans, the human beings that we are, have to be addressed. And second, we have to bring them around to feel they are not only benefiting, but they are contributing to what they are benefiting from. As human beings, they need to be doing something. So that's how we created institutions and you know, put in place mechanisms and you know, ways of delivery on the message, but also in the real terms, the results. And uh, in fact, the politics became just about that. Our politics became that of trying to make a difference in the lives of our people in which they participate 
and in which they feel they are making progress. And I'm not blaming other people for our own problems. There, are, there is a lot of that, but we decided to put it aside. <laughs> it doesn't help. We put aside the blame, the blame game, whether it is among us or between us as Rwanda, Rwandans and other people. Uh, so th that, that's what we have concentrated on, and I think looking back in the last 28 years, the way people perceive each other, they deal with each other, the way they work together, the young people who have gone to school together in a new situation. The, so the message has to keep going that, yes, we can be better, we can do better. And what we, we are trying to leave behind that to befair our country should have no place in our society. And I think it is working. You, we can see it working. You can see it. Every family that has children is able to send them to school, either by themselves or by the effort of government. Uh, people go to those who are have illnesses, they have a hospital, they have a clinic, they have a dispensary to go to and get a service that saves their lives. We have food security for our country. We, we produce now enough food to feed ourselves, to feed our population. In fact, that's how we, we, we survived even during the lockdown. The lockdowns we had, we had a number of them we used to provide food for the vulnerable families and nobody starved just because there was a lockdown. Because of what progress we have made in agriculture sector and we have food stocks and so on and so forth. Uh, Mr. President, uh, let me take the privilege of office and ask one last question. Uh, Reconciliation has been a major theme of the last 25 years. Um, we've been taught about how far this process has gone, but we've also been told that Rwandans are not so outgoing, they don't always speak what they feel. People may have their own identities that they still guard to themselves, even though they're not able to express them in public. They may even transmit this to their children. Some scholars think it takes three generations to overcome the effect of a trauma like what Rwanda went through. So my question is, how deep do you think the reconciliation process has gone? And is there still a kindling for a future explosion? The reconciliation process has been largely successful. The understanding of the need to reconcile the practice and so on and so forth. Uh, you, you, can, you can see it, you can feel it. You, you see here, well, I don't know some of these scholars or there are different categories. There are those who will speak with authority even when they have not investigated. But we respect their opinion, and especially because they are scholars. But for those who have investigated, as far as I know, they will tell you a different story. And we have had many groups that, some that have been sponsored by government to try and give us a thorough picture of what has happened, others independent, others we have known only when they are giving results. I think, now, and there's also a bit of confusion. Uh, Stephen, if you know, there are cultures 
across not only the continent but the world. The, let's, say, let's say even one part, let's say Europe, which, which is known for all good things, freedom, democracy, and so on and so forth. They don't go by one thing. From one country to another, you'll find people who are, they tell you, oh, no, country X, the people are, are, are reserved, they, they don't, then country Y, you know, these are outgoing people, anytime they're, they're just there, happy people, will do this. Then you go to another, they say, no, these are violent, they react like this, you know, you know instant. So people behave differently. Now, I'm surprised because on one hand, we have also been told that even before genocide and so on and so forth, that the Rwandans actually are reserved people. They will always listen, they are welcoming people, they listen to what you are saying, but they may reserve comments about you, not because they have nothing they think about you, but just because that's the nature. So I think part of this has come to create some confusion that even with the reserved people that Rwandans are, well, I, I, I would, by the way, want to think I'm also reserved. Only when you ask me questions, then I tell you my mind. But Otherwise, I pass without saying anything to you, even when I think of something about you. So, but the progress that has been made on the ground and the way people deal with each other, again, if anyone is looking for a perfect outcome from our efforts, then and that person is looking for a wrong thing altogether. There is nothing perfect here. Uh, but by that I'm saying there is nothing perfect there. So, but so working with these normal limits of what we are talking about, I think we are in a good place. If anything happens in Rwanda, it would be because of other reasons other than this one, that the Rwandans have been denied space of, no, the, the country is, is completely changed uh, in my view, but uh, uh, we, we can keep, and, and, and as I mentioned to you, we keep testing and re-examining and ourselves to see where have we reached, given where we have come from. We, 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 we really truly make that effort. Uh, but, but we find individuals, no question about it, maybe few people here and there. It's like um, recently during the pandemic, the, the COVID-19, you know, we had Generally, the image we had was actually now, by the way, in Africa, we are the most vaccinated country in Africa. That's for a fact. But we have also had cases of people who refused to be vaccinated. So you always have people, but what you go by is the general thing that how the majority of our people have been vaccinated, they embraced it, they... But there are others who reside in different districts of the country, either because of religion or because of their just personal beliefs. But we shall go by the fact that uh, our people embraced the vaccination and uh, not be detracted by the few who refused. So in the same way, that is the case, I think. There will be people with different views, ideas, and rejection of what has happened, and that's normal. For me, I think it's normal. 
but the majority, the, the actual core of our society has changed a great deal for, for the better. Well, on that note, uh, we're going to let you go. This has been a fascinating hour. You've got some students here who are already planning to come to Rwanda. Anytime. We had a wonderful presentation from uh, Patrick Kuroretwa a couple of weeks ago. So we threw Rwanda the security issues. Mm -hmm. uh, we heard from Francis Guitari, so we know a lot about the domestic issues. And uh, you'll see some of the kids in this room in Rwanda soon, I'm sure. Please, Thank you so much. Please, if they come, give me a call. We, we might uh, have a cup of coffee together. <laughs> the U.S., when they borrow money, they're getting it in 1.5, 1.9 interest rate. Africans, when they get the same amount of money, they're paying 9, 10%. The people who don't need a break, they get a break. The ones who need a break, they don't get a break. The sheer survival of the World Bank IMF is based on the fact that African countries and, and many other developing countries do not succeed. Their success is based on our failure. That has to change. And guess who can make that change? We, the children of Africa, we, the Africans, are the ones who have to say, we know your game now. Enough is enough. We're not playing it anymore. And this is where the diaspora come in. There are more Ghanaian doctors in New York City than in, in the entire country of Ghana. There are more doc Nigerian doctors in LA than in the entire country of Nigeria. So let's be serious here. What Africa needs is capacity, capacity, capacity. And that capacity is in the diaspora. So it behooves us to bring the diaspora together. Let them understand what is really going on in our Africa. Diaspora are not going home. Diaspora are angry about Africa because they are not understanding the root cause of why Africa is where it is today. They think getting rid of a president will take care of the problem. Far from it. That president is just going to be replaced by another one who is going to equally suffer from the same difficult environment to work in. So let's look at an Africa that must be free to take care of herself, an Africa that free from exploitation from outsiders. The multinationals who are stealing from Africa every day in broad daylight. I use an example of the DRC. If you ever fly very low over the DRC, you'll see tarmacs in the jungle. You'll see 747s flying into DRC, picking up minerals and flying right out. The same multinationals are responsible for arming young people and giving them MK-16s. Because why? Their satellites in the skies are telling them where that village is. There's, there are lots of diamonds. So what do they do? Arm young people, drag them up, and send them to go chop off a few heads. The rest of the village runs away, so they come behind and do their illegal mining. We black people must understand what is really going on. Because what we are shown instead is, oh, look at those Africans killing each other. There are some serious games that have been played in Africa for far too long. And once we understand that, we can strategize as to how we can begin to bring the difference and bring the change that Africa needs. And that change can only come if the African diaspora are united and the Wakanda villages, as I call them. It is our organized way of saying, starting with one African diaspora center of excellence, it will be a new city, a developmental hub that we can then take from there Every sector is developed. Take healthcare. How many doctors do we need in this region to take care of this many people? We pick up education, same thing. We pick up engineering. We pick up electricity. How many megawatts of power do we have in the region? How many do we need? Be it solar, be it wind, be it hydro, be it geothermal, be it nuclear. We were singing, when you were singing, the masters of the field were coming. We who are young boys are coming. The masters of the field are coming. We who are young boys are coming. To win the race, to win the race, we trust in God, we trust in God. To win the race, we trust in God. And that's for Opokuwa. Masters are coming. Masters are coming. Masters are coming to win the race. Oh, 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 oh. Masters are coming. And then they will sing. Prepare the world, yeah, yeah, yeah. Prepare the world, yeah. Then we go more, then we'll keep quiet. Then we will sing. When they tire, they will come in. Diplo, Owens. Diplo, Owens. I win again. We have to win. Then we will sing. Take a cup. We are the masters of the field and best athletes. Famous to all and decent boys, how would you prove? Then they will start. I've been quiet. I'm going to go to the house. 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 Hello, I'm going to go to the house.
Because Elevi problem no a e simple. Now Ghana government is on person or Tiase in Tine Betrimach then. No what Tiasi ye. It was your full 2020. IMF Ma Ghana one billion dollars. Billion with a B. Same year no World Bank Ma Ghana 430 million dollars. Nina for COVID. In 2021, IMF for Sam Margana, $1 billion bill. $1 billion with a B. Now, World Bank for Sam Margana, $130 million. In 2021, $1 billion, $130 million. If World Bank buy any IMF buy, no. Now, we say post COVID. Rejuvenation program say what be ma young economy no so into no World Bank ni IMF this is Ghana ma Ghana Ghana government call Bank of Ghana koyi twenty billion cedis say COVID in tea nebuchian for what World Bank ama mu two billion uh, IMF ama mu two billion World Bank ama mu five hundred and sixty million dollars for COVID. I know on some Musan call Bank of Ghana ko yi 20 billion cedis say covid in ti say si ka no wo mu hu konta nchere yen ye ana wo ebu wo mu ye be bia wo be fa wo Ghana e levy tax wo ko ports e levy wo ko airport wo ko hotels be wo dia totu bri biara so wo Ghana e levy e levy e levy say si ka no he na afa petrol e levy wo ko union ma port e levy Says he can hear now, Father. In this ne government person or chair, and say Ghana for a be a yard in any year, Jumentina or de sa eleven reba. Yes, you perceive a chair government to say, and you say, I do in year, you more year who never cosono near Jai Amano. If you say, who per se, Wunya eleven young, yeah, yeah, responsible citizens, yeah, per se, yeah, 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 stand by, yet, Jina Hockey car, yet, train fire. Or no one can say a responsible citizens, right? Into a responsible citizens. Nana Tinne say, So what per se would free sika? Not would the Yebribia? Because young credit rating record former. And yet young Abra bought now the E levy barber to so. I didn't because there is over three, almost three billion Ghana cities a record to the presidency. Three billion Ghana. Into it also by seventy five percent. What also by seventy five percent? I will say by three hundred and seventy five million dollars. Three hundred and seventy five million. Save and not at the presidency. You don't need three billion Ghana cities going to the presidency. Then now what are you, Mister Kufuado? And the near cost of presidency. Then now what is the can of presidency? What? What is then? What is she usruku? And now then now what is it? Legislature, le Ghana legislators, yeah, well, 275 legislators. Then, as our legislators know, what well, yeah, Magana say, say, minimum, can say, hey, Ghana, if we you bet me, Afa, I install it, Watson, IBM computer, or friend, is Watson, no, ah, a yeah, artificial intelligence, ah, every yeah, nine over 90 percent of young parliamentarians, no. You bet me a replace one with Watson. Watson computer by one juma. Now, yen downscale. I then you hear 275 parliamentarians out. Then we are Magana. One liability to Ghanaians in a year over 100,000 cities every month per parliamentarian. 100,000 cities. Kona kubun kunta na he. Enu echi. What was judiciary? Judiciary he. America yeah 330 million people. 11 times the size of Ghana. Ghana is 30.8 million. America were nine Supreme Court judges. A Kufuado Bana saying Ghana near were 10 Supreme Court judges. A Kufuado are 28. Akaho. In to say, say Ghana, 30, a, a country of less than 31 million people, no, yeah, were 18 Supreme Court judges. Ding, ne how young? 18. Then now, I think young now just a 
Kronga will be asking now, Ghana, and they won't see you here. Supreme Court judges, didn't see you Supreme Court judges, a country of less than 31 million, 18 Supreme Court judges. Ka, ka, one Supreme Court judge, be a no liability, April hundred and fifty thousand dollars, hundred and fifty thousand cities a month. Kona Kubun Kuntahe, ne V8, ordered them, ne bodyguards, ne ne driver, ne ne te, ne crony ba. Then in T Niafa an extra eight Supreme Court judges. And no kwan cheng say see a menumoka say ye wa thirty four uh uh friend uh 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 ambassadorial post around the world thirty four Vatican City ah e wo room kra ye wo ambassador wo ho then na ambassador wo Vatican City ye magana mon can chile yenge I think the ambassadors will be able to say more than the uh, friend in Sri Lanka, say, uh, the Sudan, no money. They then or come on a year, they buy in the year what ambassadors will Sudan. It doesn't make any kind of sense. So, we will read 11. What is this? Yes, some were 58 uh, uh, diplomatic missions around the world. Diplomatic mission, no, and Kahun Fasuna said, we will trade desk. Eddy income, commerce, a bread Ghana. So diplomatic missions around the world, they are 50, 80. Sika ben wa de bread Ghana. Moun kanchire ye near here. E ye krong, waste of money and resource. Muse mo refe e levy. Ye betchira mo se e levy. No moun kona moun ko yi infi mo amu futu mo. Positions na mo kreti ya hu ninfa sono. E hon na moun ko yi infi. Aden na mo hao Ghana for sa MPP for. Den na Ghana for ye moun ti. Na de biya ye nchi ya se, ye nchi ya se no. Sa position see now it was hey, wo, wo, over two thousand executive positions are what were executive benefits and the perks wo to kwang wo business class wo nya uh, four by four no money this any money nasi wo yi fi ho and I what also and no no be ma eleven no income from eleven ye be nya fi ho mroso 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 then necessary catch the a kufu adu ne wo government say sa de no munko yi yi fi ho no na mo boka Ghana foka unnecessarily. Na mu bwe wye yi ne wye. Na eskavete sa unyanku pwa dom yen se yen sa unko ka. Ni yen nang na ni yen fan nye si ka ni yen fan tu yen yi levi ka son. Mwa be ka chen se mwa kwa shiwe eskavete sa 85. Eskavete sa ba kon ye over 150,000 to 200,000. Mwa sa kwa shiwe na ka hon. Na pa no no wehi ye zi. Kop no wehi. Eh ti no wehi ya anom. Kop no so a wabbo na ka hon. Hey, Ekufu Ado and his government. Why? Ghana for Yem Penende and Penetina, Elevino, one eye as a bash and one eye, and quite free scan was a ba. Yem Pen in a lay, what when eh? Eh, Yenmo Babbe, who ye be genome the name and say Yerem Penet, Ekufu Ado and his government. A ding, a ding. What's it? When uh, cluelessness meets unpreparedness, no. MPP in Funi now be home. Yabram, we're not going to take this, we're not having this. Mumfa, Yam Penina, Impenichina, Elevenu, Yedia, Munko, Inqua Cat, Legislature, Munko Cat, Executive, Munko Cat, Judiciary, Nasi Can Ambassadors, and the Wafriend Ambassadorial Post, and the uh, 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 the diplomatic missions. Sanya many now won't cancel, no more reduce. No more for computers in your hair. Legislators say you're worth 275. You know, you bet me the drone, drone, I replace you one. You're here 275 at the maximum four per region. You're here 64 parliamentarians. You're here 211 parliamentarians. You no, know, where your liability to Ghana at about 100,000 cities every month. You're in Chawung in Fiho. Come on, enough of this nonsense. Yerim. Yerim. I want your word in class symbol. Okay. Okay. So when we are in class symbol of knowledge, strength, adaptability, <laughs> energy, freedom, unity, hope, peacemaking, harmony, intelligence, Continue. power of love, strength. Said in class symbols when you know you be a bra, bo be a baby or boy, yeah. Now the sign and no pepper no. Na ye di aka and in class symbols in a home. Okay. Now Ghana for what tena si ya hunu se said ya nana do nan kwa kufu adu ebu ne mine. Ya ni jeho. And see, this is the edin class symbol for failure. What? It's a free nadeko. Said in class symbol. Who spells him you know ya? 
Your president is now a free nigger. Photo and a for failure. You are a failure. You are a failure. You are a failure. You are a failure. You it is a castle. Oh, man, you're here, my. Hey! Then, num, a memoir, and quiet, you know. Mother. I come to you.